I'm going to get us started. We may have a few more people wandering in, but um, I want us to have as much chance as we can to hear from Cliff. Uh, I'm really thrilled that Cliff gets to be here, and I get to introduce him to you if you haven't Excited. met him already. Uh, Cliff is a professor at the School of Information at Michigan, um, and he has been a, a sort of a, a light in our field for several years um, in both sort of HCI, but also read much more widely uh, in, in many of the fields that I play in. Um, I like to think that I've been thinking about content moderation for a long time, uh, but when I started thinking about content moderation, I realized all the smart things Cliff had already <laughs> said about Slashdot and online communities uh, uh, that were sort of well uh, ahead of the things I was thinking about and were super helpful. Um, so I'm really thrilled that you're here. Thank, Thank you, you so much. That's very kind because I plan to steal about half your book for my <laughs> comments today. So, so my name's Cliff. I am an old Slashdot moderator. Anybody know Slashdot? All right, there's my old school nerds in the room. Bless your hearts. Uh, there we go. Uh, and I was a researcher on Slashdot back in the day. I was actually their chief scientist, though I think that was mostly jokingly said. Um, I study human computer interaction, social computing, computer mediated communication. I'm also deep into organizing the SIGCHI conferences. So if you want to know anything about conference organizing, let me know, and we can talk about that for hours, literally. Um, a couple of, of just positions for myself, just because of the work that we're doing. One thing, this, this uh, presentation will have some work that I'm doing in harassment and hate speech and everything, so there will be some content that you might find distressing or that's not very polite. Uh, uh, not being polite is the least of it sometimes. So just to give you a kind of a heads up on that. Um, I like to, to position myself, I am a moderate left in U.S. political kind of spectrum, which is like, I think, um, uh, conservative in Europe, right? And... <laughs> And I, and I say that just because a lot of the groups I study, I try to always challenge my own assumptions and beliefs about especially the conservative groups that I study. Um, and I always disclose with them when I'm studying them who I am and, and where I'm coming from. Um, and then I would also say my brand of research is interventionist. If you're not familiar with the HCI community, which many of you are not, it's all oriented towards design and coming up with solutions to problems kind of thing, which has its strengths and limitations as a scientific approach uh, that I'd be happy to talk about more to at some point. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is that I'm drawing a lot of this work on a shared NSF grant I have with Sarita Yardi Shunabek and JJ Prescott. Sarita was an intern here in 2011. She met her husband, Grant, here. Now they have four beautiful, like seriously adorable children that I think you can all claim credit for. Um, <laughs> And she's a rock star researcher. I hate the term rock star. She's a great researcher. Uh, J.J. Prescott is uh, our colleague in the law school. Uh, he has a Ph.D. in economics from MIT and a J.D. from uh, Harvard. Uh, and he was a clerk for Merrick Garland. So he's the guy who's there to give me like a lot of imposter syndrome about it, what, what it means to accomplish things. He's, he's great. And he's our informant about justice. And uh, every couple weeks we sit down with him and he teaches us about the law and about criminal justice. All right, so this idea, the, the idea that I'm talking about here is that people do bad things, right? This is not a new concept. This is something that our uh, human civilization has been dealing with. And in fact, a lot of civilization is structured around mitigating the bad things that people do. This is the Book of the Dead, which uh, the, uh, from the Book of the Dead, it's the Papyrus of Ani, which it lists a whole bunch of sins that you can claim guilt over. My favorite was, uh, I have not multiplied my words in speaking, which just means that I'm not a bore. I'm not overly verbose, which I love that the idea of being a bore is a sin and is bad news for academia. <laughs> Defining bad has been something, you know, philosophers, religious scholars, everybody has really thought about that for a long time. I'm not going to go into defining bad more broadly. Uh, but we think about them in terms of norms and laws often, right? You can break norms. Norms are basically what should you do in polite society, right? Like there's no law that says that you guys have to sit in chairs facing me. There's no law that says you can't be talking right now over me, right? But we have norms in a situation like this that uh, shape kind of our behavior and tell us what to do. Norms are great because they're flexible. They adapt with social context. They're, but they're also imprecise and they're often unfair, Norms are often embedded in dominant cultures and in a whole set of things that uh, make them so they're not evenly applied to all people within a system. Laws, on the other hand, are inflexible, they're clunky, but they're mostly precise and mostly fair. Not 100%, obviously. Nobody's going to look at the U.S. criminal justice system and say that's rocking 100% fairness. But the goal is to be fair. The goal is equal application of the law to all people, no matter their status, even if we don't often achieve that goal. So, 
laws and norms are ways that we have defined what is good or bad. And that's broadly for all of human experience. Luckily, I'm not in charge of all of human experience. What I worry about is why do people do bad things online and what can we do about it? Right? And that's one of the things, uh, and I always like to just position what does online mean in this case, or why do we care about online? I often accuse the HCI community of taking any aspect of human endeavor and just adding the word online to it and inventing a whole new subfield, right? Uh, I've been guilty of that myself maybe once or twice. But let's talk about what, why does online matter. Um, and a lot of that comes down to there's lots of ways that computer-mediated communication people have talked about why online matters. The thing I think about is affordances, right? Affordances are basically uh, perceptual features in both hardware and software that enable people to perceive certain types of actions that they can take. Right? And both hardware and software have affordances. Uh, hardware, part of the big push in social media over the past 10 years have been changes in hardware affordances. Longer battery life, for instance, affords more portability. Uh, you know, uh, smaller size of a device allows ubiquity, those kinds of things. Software also has a ton of affordances. Your uh, colleague Dana has written about this a lot, of course, uh, as have others of you maybe. The idea here isn't so much that we need to understand the affordances per se for this talk, but I just, my perspective is that software systems, and especially online social media systems, are designed environments, right? They're architected. They have structure that somebody's making a decision about. So if they're architected and they're designed, we can design them differently, right? And we think about a lot of these uh, platforms, what they really are, they're just bundles of different features that afford different types of social interactions uh, that shape how people behave. Make sense? All right. So people experience what I kind of colloquially called in the title talk, adversarial interactions online. Uh, that's a really kind of antiseptic academic way of saying uh, people hurt each other. And there are very broad categories of these bad behaviors. I typically divide it into people harming each other through social media. So this is like cyberbullying and harassment, doxing, things like that, versus people we consider bad who use social media in the same way like an instant pot community would or a mom's group or anybody else, right? So social media or online platforms in general have a lot of great features that support collective action. Those features support your local uh, environmental group and they support your local uh, white supremacist group in pretty much the exact same way. So those are the two broad categories. People engaged in a societally harmful action versus people who are harming each other through these platforms. Let me walk you through two examples of types of adversarial interactions that our groups are studying. Uh, at the University of Michigan to kind of give you a sense of what these things look like. How many of you study or, or take a look at kind of online hate or any of these types of things? A couple of you, all right, just my usual suspects. So great, some of this will be new for you and I apologize in advance for ruining any uh, hope for humanity that you had when you walked into the room. All right, so one thing I've been looking at a lot right now is uh, online radicalization or red pilling, they call it. They call it red pilling, of course, because of the movie The Matrix. Uh, you take the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Right? Basically what it is is converting somebody's point of view to a more radical, usually conservative-facing point of view. Right? And they call it red pilling because what they're trying to do is to wake you up. Right? They're trying to teach you that uh, the world's not as simple or it's not the narrative that you've been told. You've been lied to your entire life, and if you wake up, then you'll see the truth. Hate groups have uh, grown in the United States. They've always been part of our culture in the United States, uh, but they've had a particularly good effect in the past few years. And they've uh, early adopters and effective users of online technologies. Uh, this is the Southern Poverty Law Center, tracks different types of hate groups in the United States um, and defines what a hate group is, uh, which can often be kind of contentious, um, and have tracked uh, a little over 1,000 hate groups operating as kind of structured organizations within the United States. All of those online hate groups use social media, online platforms, collaborative tools to structure their work activity, right? The work of hate is something they do. Now, of course, they wouldn't see themselves as hate groups. And that's part of where I want us to make sure that we think about challenging our own beliefs. It's not like somebody goes into um, the, the 
Internet Europa group and thinks, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to really hate on people. They think that they're loving their own or they think that they're trying to create a better society because miscegenation of the races is destroying both races and they just want to keep people separate and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So they, they usually, they wouldn't describe themselves as bad people, most of these folks, right? They have a point of view that we consider socially deviant in a mainstream cultural standpoint, but to themselves within their subgroup, they have a consistent set of beliefs and see themselves as good actors. Um, and what they tend to do is try to use online platforms to spread their message in one way or the other. And part of how they do that is by creating strong in-groups or out-groups. One of the ways I first started studying, oh, here's an example of the, the red pill on Reddit. Uh, this is a, the red pill is a specific community or a specific subreddit uh, related to the incels community. Incels stands for involuntary celibates. It's a group of men who believe that, especially feminism has destroyed the U.S. society, has created a set of weak men um, that if uh, we redistribute power to a more patriarchal society, uh, that we'll have a stronger, better society, right? And so they believe, for instance, in uh, forced sexual relationships and a whole bunch of kind of really what I think of as gross ideas. Uh, what struck me when I first started studying these groups is how similar radicalization is no matter what the ideology of the radical, right? So this is a group that was created um, out of Europe and out of the Hague, basically, uh, looking at how does uh, Islamic radical belief systems start and then propagate amongst each other. And you can see some of the same processes we talk about, right? You create an in-group and you create an out-group. With the in-group, you send narrative messages about how the in-group is right, how they're trying to do the right thing, and how they're good people. When you define the out-group, you imbue them with negative values. You uh, uh, show them that they're responsible for your suffering in one way or the other. So for uh, ISIS and other kinds of Islamic radicals, the in-group was uh, the caliphate, and the goal was the caliphate, and that true believers of their ideology were just trying to create a paradise on earth. For people who had been suppressed by an outgroup, which is mostly Westerners, uh, with good evidence that Westerns, uh, Westerners had caused uh, severe damage to parts of the Middle East, right? And so you create that outgroup, you show they're responsible for your suffering, you enhance the values of your in-group, and that's how you start to radicalize people. Now, the best way to do this is just throwing messages out there and trying to get people to watch your messages. Uh, that process overall is the same process that we see, it, whether it's about misogyny, about white supremacy, about hatred of Jewish people, whatever it happens to be, any radical process seems to follow this same basic pattern. Keep an in, make an in-group, make an out-group, and then exacerbate them. The other thing that we see here is that there's a spectrum of effects that we see. I think a lot of people uh, trivialize the effects of radicalization like, well, how successful are they going to be? They're not, the incels movement is not going to take every male in the United States and convert them into thinking about forced sexual relationships, right? But that's not what they're trying to do. When, when radicals think about people who are not them, they have this whole spectrum of people from people who are uh, vehemently against them, who are useful in that they can be mocked and uh, kind of caricaturized as the outgroup to people who are engaged, who are reading their comments, or at least kind of the more vanilla forms of their comments, to kind of these supporters. The radicals themselves uh, call these normies, right? They're people who are sympathetic to your ideas. They may not engage in violent actions themselves. They may not uh, ever, you know, uh, do what a lot of incels members do, which is engage in mass shooting or something like that. But they will uh, uh, denigrate women in an online forum, or they'll do something else that supports kind of the overall cause that these people have. The other thing that we find, this is a really great article out of Nature that just came out this year. These uh, uh, hate groups and these radicalization groups are incredibly resilient and spread across networks very uh, richly. So we see across the top are basically, these are all, um, the green nodes are uh, sub-threads within a Russian discussion site. Uh, that's uh, famous for kind of hosting conspiracy theories and alt-right content. And you can see the, the February 13th, 2018 is before the Parkland shooting. And you can see uh, the, the kind of disparity of that network. It, the edges, I think, they said in the, the next are people who are kind of 
uh, uh, posting in two of these communities within this kind of conspiracy community overall. Uh, and so you can just see that these communities change and grow richer over time. The basic lesson is that, uh, and this one is where the, they had started to shut down, the red nodes here are shut down conspiracy theory sites that were being tracked, but we see that more and more people were going into the conspiracy sites and, and discussing one another, kind of, the, you know, and it, it was all about false flag, that Parkland was a false flag operation, that this mass shooting hadn't happened, that it was all just crisis actors who were making up having been shot, uh, which is a common thread when you, that you see with mass shootings more broadly. So uh, it's a really resilient pattern, and one of the things that make it particularly hard to fight is it can move across platforms. Platforms can try to solve their own problems, but they rarely solve each other's problems. And so when you move across platforms and can move from node to node within this kind of conspiracy or radicalization network, then it makes it really hard to tamp down radicalization. The pathway for this is also uh, shows a really kind of rich ecology. This is a very simplified model that I kind of came up with that's in no way completely accurate, but it just gives you an idea where you have a site like Telegram, which is an encrypted uh, discussion platform. I've been studying the Proud Boys, which is a white supremacist group for a couple of years. And they use Telegram, for instance, like you would contact somebody through a, a Google Mail address. They would send you credentials to get into Proud Boys once you kind of prove your bona fides. And Telegram is where they coordinate a lot of their action, right? Because the encryption protects them from law enforcement to a large extent. But 8chan uh, would then often be a site where you would move to coordinate more publicly. So you might take your private coordination or your private plan from Telegram, move it to 8chan, which got closed, but kind of back again or 4chan or one of these other sites that exist. Then the process is to move it to uh, extreme, but not that extreme uh, kind of other platforms. So you can move it to Reddit, for instance, uh, to the Red Pill or to the Donald or something like that. Take the content that you strategize here, move it into a more mainstream site where you get more eyeballs attached to it. That intersects with kind of uh, the Jordan Peterson, Ben Shapiro podcast world where they will pick up these fringe ideas from these more extreme sites and talk about them, uh, sometimes support them, sometimes not, but uh, they have a conservative audience, so there the connection then becomes to a podcast like Joe Rogan's podcast. Anybody listen to Joe Rogan? Watch his show? Yeah, me too. Uh, he uh, is one of the most popular podcasters in the United States right now, right? Huge, huge audience. And he'll have on people like Ben Shapiro or Milo Yiannopoulos or, uh, you know, uh, the InfoWars guy, Alex Jones. And he legitimizes basically this fringe discussion that's been happening to a mainstream discussion. And then that gets pushed into Facebook memes that your aunt shares, uh, uh, you know, back and forth or your uncle or whomever it is. And we all have at least one family member, right, who keeps sharing uh, these memes. Uh, some of those are created authentically in these spaces. Some of them are explicit disinformation campaigns. Yeah. Yeah. Has there been work in, say, like the part that you know, like, what would be the motivation for, you know, pushing such a theory and sort of doing all that like work to get it out there and to popularize the theory? Yeah, there's a couple. I don't think anybody's done the systematic work, which is something we should do. Um, I, the the from the motivations I've seen expressed in a lot of these communities, some is just genuine belief, right? Some people uh, feel like these are actual uh, conspiracies that are happening. For some people, though, it is the idea that stricter gun regulation is worse than the occasional shooting. So whatever derails the message that would lead to more gun regulation is worth derailing by any means necessary. Uh, and then, you know, the Joe Rogans, uh, for instance, Rogan's a good example. He's just, a, he's a libertarian who believes, he's an absolutist viewpoint towards free speech. Uh, and so he just feels like he's a good actor trying to give everybody a voice in the discussion. All right. So an example of work we're doing in this space, we're looking, uh, we're doing work that is a combination of kind of um, uh, data scraping from Twitch and YouTube gamer channels. Everybody have a, any small kids in the room? You know how much they watch video game streaming now? It's one of the fastest growing areas of kids entertainment to watch other people play video games. Well, the alt-right knows this. And so some of these radicalized groups, what they've decided to do, and we picked up some of this chatter in Telegram and uh, recently on MeWe, is to do, do what I call pink pilling, 
which is you're not going to convert a kid into a mass shooter, not necessarily, but what you do is you uh, pepper your game stream with language that's purposely dismissive of progressive terms, right? So you use terms like safe space or snowflake as a way to denigrate progressive values without the kids even knowing they're being radicalized to denigrate progressive terms. Right, and that's a specific radicalization strategy that we're we're right now trying to figure out how to best test this with kids and uh, how to measure what the effect of this is. I don't think either the uh, people, the radicals, or we know if this is an effective strategy or not. If this actually does change anything, uh, but they often they're very experimental uh, and they'll try lots of different methods like this. All right, so that's radicalization. Another big area of work that we look at and think about is online harassment. So these are just the standard Pew slides you have to show every time you talk about online harassment. Uh, lots of people experience online harassment in the country. Mostly that's offensive name calling, purposeful embarrassment. Uh, it gets more serious, stalking, sexual harassment, doxing, revenge porn. We just saw, of course, a U.S. Congresswoman have to step down because of a re revenge porn incident uh, that was aimed against her. Uh, you know, lots and lots of people are experiencing this, and it's disproportionately being experienced by the vulnerable people, both young, people of color, women of color, uh, though are especially vulnerable to these types of effects. Most, uh, more than a quarter of Americans have decided not to post because they see others being harassed. Um, so it's, it has a chilling effect on what we think of as the positive benefits of these social computing platforms. Uh, and you can see the harms that people talk about, which is largely stress and emotional problems. But we do see, of course, suicides and problems losing jobs, et cetera, et cetera, that can happen through these things as well. So online harassment is bad. Uh, harassment in general is bad. Online harassment is particularly hard to stop, though. One example that we've been working on recently is sea lioning on Wikipedia. Uh, my student, Elizabeth Whitaker, did an internship with Aaron Hafaker at, oh, I think I have a picture of them. Yeah. Uh, so first off, who knows the term sea lioning? A couple of you, right? It's basically a, a lightweight form of harassment. I don't know if it's lightweight. It's a form of harassment where you tr try to derail a conversation by politely insisting on evidence or a certain tone uh, that you have no intention of actually respecting, right? And it's based off this old comic uh, is the origin of the term sea lioning, if you ever wondered. You're all reading it, so I'll wait two more seconds while we... <laughs> it's a really common strategy that you see in a lot of political discussion boards. Um, and so one of the things we were looking at, we were just talking, I was talking to Charles about what's the definition of civility and how a lot of people call for civility these days. Uh, I like Zizi Papacharisi's definition. She wrote a paper in 2014 where she defined it not so much as we be nice to each other, which I think is kind of the common and unhelpful definition of civility, but that we're collaboratively working towards an end goal together. And so we decided to study Wikipedia talk pages. We did this with Aaron Hafaker, who's a <laughs> principal scientist at the Wikimedia Foundation. Elizabeth's a, a PhD student in my lab. And uh, what we did is we found that we interviewed women editors and we talked about what kinds of experiences were they having. We weren't actually looking for harassment at that time. We were just really interested. Wikipedia has ha long had a gender uh, problem and she was just interviewing women editors. And she found a lot of harassment, but it wasn't obvious harassment. One type of harassment that they were having were things like this, right? They were being accused by male editors of not abiding to the NPOV standards, the neutral point of view standards, and being asked to prove that they, that they were being neutral which is a you know, really hard thing. So the, what we were finding were that people were using the policies and rules of Wikipedia to actually harass and to keep down women editors on the site and to chase them out of the space, right? So it felt like, from a, a, a long-distance view, it looked like a very reasonable thing. Well, I'm just asking you to follow the rules. I'm just asking for evidence that you're following our policies. But, of course, its effects were a harassing effect, right, uh, for the women who were involved. All right, so those are a couple of types. We have a lot of studies going on in these different spaces. Um, this gets us into these bad things happen, but what do we do when bad things happen? Offenses, if we think about the criminal justice system more broadly, need to be both detected or caught, you know, uh, and they need to be punished. In online space, that's no different. Uh, machine learning tools have gained a lot of popularity and have gotten better over time in detecting some of these big th bad things that happen. From the early days of just kind of bag of word approaches to looking for bad words in spaces to now much more sophisticated ways of detecting bad behavior, machine learning tools have gotten pretty good 
uh, and the platforms are really depending heavily on these machine learning, uh, learning platforms into the future, right? Uh, Zuckerberg himself has made a lot of public statements about how he expects in five years to stop the misinformation and harassment problems on Facebook through the use of machine learning tools. He's, he's been wrong before, is all I'll say about that. That's all I'll say about that. Uh, and even though, and even then, the problem becomes is once you detect a crime, which I think is analogous to like arresting a criminal, you still then need to punish them. You need to remediate the crime somehow. And how do we as a, a species think about remediating uh, offenses or bad things that happen? What is the goal of justice is basically what this is, right? How do we think about how justice should work? This is something uh, that is, of course, a long, another, here's another uh, old archaeological slide. Uh, the Code of the Hammurabi is well known to many of us, of course. Um, and, it comes, and from it comes the term, uh, if a man destroy the eye of another man, they shall destroy his eye, right? So eye for an eye justice is literally out of the Hammurabi Code. Uh, what, I, what I always forget and what I always find um, somewhat depressing is then it got, talks about free men, which is a type of sl- serf, and then slaves, and like how there are lesser punishments for all of these subordinate or, or lower status people that I find a little bit depressing. But, you know, the, the basics is still this retributive approach to justice, right? So the Code of the Hammurabi uh, became a template of sorts. And it wasn't the first code. The Code of Hammurabi was actually... Um, you know, probably a consolidation of a lot of codes that had happened before it. And we actually have multiple versions of the code that we know, we know it changed and evolved over time during this period uh, in the Fertile Crescent. But in, the Fertile, in Egypt and Mesopotamia, this code of law and this idea of retributive justice became the dominant form of justice. Now, that wasn't true universally, right? Across the world, there were other forms of justice in Africa, in the Americas, in Asia being developed that were, some were retributive, but others were not. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, that spread then to, e- to, to Greece, uh, from, especially from Egypt, and Aristotle and Socrates became the basis for a lot of how Western thought in general dealt with the idea of justice. And we don't really challenge that, right? Does anybody ever think that a crime shouldn't be punished, right? That that we have a model for retributive justice that, especially if you're a Westerner, is just baked super deep into our heads. And in fact, one of the things I always find challenging when I give this talk or when I talk about this work is people can't envision another way of doing justice. Right? Often I'm a, I will ask people, well, well why do we need police, right? uh, and just as a kind of provocational question. And people gasp visibly about that. Like it's, just, it's so baked into who we are as a culture. So retributive justice, as it's been handed down to us from that long history, is primarily concerned with delivering a just dessert for a morally wrong act. I was exactly 42 years old when I found out that's the right spelling of just dessert, too. I thought it meant like a bad pudding that you got because you've been a bad boy uh, and always spelled it wrong for 42 actual years. But uh, retributive justice is that you deserve what you get, right? That if you do something bad, if you break the code of society, that something bad will happen to you. And that is, of course, how we treat our current criminal justice system. We often find that this epistemology is so deep in our heads that we have a strong retributive mindset as people. And in fact, when we feel like the law is not uh, do it, being appropriately retributive, we will often be retributive ourselves. There's a form of harassment that takes place um, in online spaces called the pile-on, which is basically somebody does a bad thing and a whole bunch of people pile on to tell that person what a bad thing they did and harass them. So it's a form of harassment, but it feels just. It's mob justice, basically, right? Kind of the, one of the more famous examples of this is Justine Sacco. Uh, who got onto a plane on a plane in England, said something racist, and by the time she landed in South Africa, her life had been completely destroyed, right? Um, that felt like justice to a lot of people. She had said something she shouldn't have said, and so her life was disrupted because of that. It's a, a, an offense and a retributive act, right? We did a series of studies uh, with my student, uh, uh, Sarita's and my student, Lindsay Blackwell, and uh, a person at the time, Chen Yang, who was a master student at the time, but now is a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon, uh, where we were trying to test this, right? How, 
how, what is people's propensity towards justice and especially retribution in online spaces? Uh, Lindsay has since gone on and broken my heart and gone to work for Facebook. Uh, so she's doing this work over there. So we basically prompted people, they were placed into experimental conditions where we were told that one of the people in this thread, Sarah, uh, had stolen $100 from an elderly couple. Another group uh, in another condition were told she had stolen $1,000 from an elderly couple. And then uh, we had Sarah say this rude, terrible thing. Um, I hate that word, and it's interesting the pre-testing we did to figure out that that was the right word to use. Uh, I can have a whole separate conversation about the pre-testing for that. Um, People, when there was more money involved, when it was seemed like Amy or Sarah's original crime was higher, felt that she deserved that more than for the lower crime, right? We have this retributive framework kind of baked into how we think about where we respond to people. We also did a follow-up with this where we looked at interventions, and we found that uh, if there were comments on this agreeing with Sarah, then people felt even better about the retributive justice that... Uh, uh, Sarah was receiving. So it's just, you know, we find that people have a strong appetite for this. Uh, the other thing we did is um, took measurements that are survey measurements, psycho, uh, social survey measurements of people's kind of propensity towards retribution. Uh, and we found that, in fact, there was great variance in our population of people who had different propensities towards retribution. And as you might expect, that propensity affected how much they thought this was a justified tweet at the uh, original person. We're following up with that work. One of the things we're trying to do now is uh, vary, for instance, uh, interface features. So if you see a reported sign, does that change whether you think this is appropriate or if you think this is just? Uh, we're also adding likes and dislikes and you know, kind of subtle interface changes. But the thing is, we don't know the scientific impacts of some of these subtle changes. Remember I talked about affordances and design. Uh, we don't know how these designs affect people's belief about what should or shouldn't happen. So we just we need to start doing that grunt work of just systematically testing all these different things and seeing what happens. Yeah. Yeah. So that's probably after this one. Um, we have strong theories for why we would expect this to be different if it were male and female, uh, or if it were non-binary, or if there were racial differences. Uh, we, we kept everybody white women specifically to try to hold constant the uh, race and gender effects that we anticipate. You, you said that the motivation for sort of testing all these different features out is to figure out what the optimal design is, but I feel like the policy is just to delete this tweet, right? Could like, be, yeah. I mean, that's the other thing. We, I don't know that... I guess I'm wondering what, why, why do you want to test all these different features when clearly for this language... Like, it seems pretty black and white, you just delete it, right? Well, I, I wish that were more clear. Um, a lot of, we'll talk more about why just deleting it probably wouldn't work as a feature, uh, because a lot of platforms are just allergic to deletion as a moderation scheme. Yeah. So the problem we have is that retributive mechanisms often fail online. That's actually a great lead into what we're going to talk about right now. Uh, this is my advisor and office mate, Paul Resnick, wrote a paper about this with Eric Friedman 110 years ago now uh, called The Social Cost of Cheap Pseudonyms, where they did this with eBay data. And it's just, it's the sock puppet problem, right? If you get punished for an action you take in an online space, you just create a new account and carry on with your dirty business, right? Like that's a cheap pseudonym or the ability to create multiple accounts really easily, which all these platforms are incentivized to do, make it so it's really hard to enforce people. Imagine, for instance, if our only punishment, if you were in an offline justice system, were that we, could, we would kill you, right? Like, which is the same as kind of like uh, deleting a person or, or canceling them from the platform. But it's okay because you can immediately create a new body and just carry on with your business, right? Like the, the allegories between kind of our offline criminal justice system and online punishment really break down when you think about the affordances of the software and how we can't really enforce much of how we do in offline space. There's no allegory to jail really in the internet. So I often turn back to good old Larry Lessig when I'm feeling lost about what to do about this. <laughs> I know it's ridiculous for a grown person to depend on this framework for theory, but I do. Uh, and I like it because he talks about the law, legal policies, and site policies. Uh, for instance, can the law help us uh, solve this problem, right? Can we somehow in the U.S. make it so that's illegal to use that word or to do things? The thing I have learned teaching at the law school for the past two years at Michigan is no. 
The U.S. law is not going to be of any help to us. Don't look to it. Turn away from the law. It is not there for you. The other thing that we have are site policies, right? You can create a site policy saying certain things are not allowed on our site. And, of course, we've seen over the past few weeks huge debates and arguments about that play out uh, in the media, right? So uh, Mark Zuckerberg has agreed to allow uh, lies and false dis misinformation and disinformation in political ads on Facebook, right? And th that's a policy decision that Facebook has made that there's been plenty of critique about and discussion back and forth about whether that's the right thing to do. So we also have the architecture, which is kind of the code of the site. Can we change, can we make new interfaces? Can we change, basically, uh, the nudge philosophy, right? Can, if, I, if I put in the right thing, uh, this optimal design, am I going to enable people to have the right mechanism uh, or the right kind of uh, reaction? One of the things we found in another study that we did with the site HeartMob is people are really unclear if they've been harassed or not. So we did interviews with people who had faced harassment in HeartMob, and the thing that stuck out to us was... The, th the reason why they went to HeartMob in the first place was it wasn't clear to them how hurt they should be, right? They had felt attacked. They had felt piled on. And in one case, one woman was doxxed. And was, but because they don't, they, there's no common experience, there's no framework for this, part of what they were looking for is just validation that what they experienced was harassment, right? So how can we help shape some of these processes? All right. So other reasons why this won't work. Uh, as Tarleton has written about, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act of 1996 means that the platforms are really just indemnified from any actual responsibility from all of this. Um, and that's just not going to change. Uh, there's been whispers of that changing, but that's just not going to change. Uh, there is actually Section 230 if you've never had a chance to read it. I, I don't anticipate that you do. I just, yeah. Um, attempts at moderation inevitably lead to false positives, right? Um, the famous example, uh, like Diamond and Silk, for instance, conservative uh, video bloggers got banned from <laughs> Facebook. And the first one of the last times Zuckerberg was at uh, Congress, that's all any conservative congressman would ask him about is why did you ban Diamond and Silk? They're great, right? <laughs> and the whole nine yards. And those false positives provide ammunition that the companies don't want. So recently, there was a White House social media summit, uh, which was basically just a bunch of people complaining about how Google and Twitter and Facebook are banning conservative voices and things like that. Um, one of my favorites for that, Devin Nunes has been an incredibly activist in terms of trying to change this, and that's because people made parody accounts called Devin Nunes' Cow and Devin Nunes' Mother. Um, and Devin Nunes' Cow was relentless at uh, trolling and teasing Devin Nunes, and he got super mad about that, like way more mad than you would think a grown man would get about a cow, but he got mad. Um, platforms in general do not want to be the arbiters of free speech, again, as Tarleton has written about, right? For a variety of good reasons. One is they're always going to make a mistake for somebody, right? No matter what decision they make, somebody's going to be mad at them for their decision. And these are companies that do not want people to be mad at them because mad people don't watch ads. <laughs> you know, and so... <laughs> So they, they have to be careful. They, they want somebody else to make this decision. Zuckerberg has been calling for Congress to act on this for years at this point, wanting something more like GDPR in Europe to handle some of these issues. Recently, the Senate had hearings about cross-platform initiatives that they could uh, get in place. But if the platforms are in charge of this, they make mistakes, and each one of those mistakes gets hit by mainstream media. I just said mainstream media. Uh, and they get a lot of crap. Scale is a huge problem, as you guys know from your position. How do I actually scale up any of these solutions to the scale of how, much, how many seconds of YouTube video are there uploaded every single moment of the day, right? Uh, platforms are federated. I can come up with a solution that will fix the incredible radicalization and child pornography problems we see on YouTube, but that won't then uh, switch to MeWe, and it won't switch to Twitch. Uh, all of these platforms have to come up with independent solutions. They do talk to one another, but still really hard to have one common framework across all of them. So for that and a couple of other reasons, re typical retributive approaches are not working to solve the problem of moderation. We're recommending uh, restorative justice as at least a way of looking at how we remediate these bad things that happen in a different way. So restorative justice was, uh, started to become really popular in the 1970s. A lot of it stems from fe feminist critique of like John Rawls and, and typical uh, William Kant and typical ideas about justice. Uh, it was informed by African-American studies and Native American studies and a whole bunch of kind of, if, if you were against the colonialists, 
you are helping to inform basically this restorative justice approach. And the idea of restorative justice, I think, is most commonly known by people through the Truth and Reconciliation Committee Commission uh, post-apartheid, right? Which was, you know, if you compare that with the Nuremberg trials and uh, different, that's the, the ultimate retributive approach to justice, and Truth and Reconciliation was the ultimate restorative approach. Uh, painful for everybody, did not go perfectly uh, in any way, shape, or form, but was probably the most large-scale restorative justice approach we'd seen at the time. So goals of restorative justice are to put key decisions into the hands of these most affected by the crime. Uh, it's to not just file a report and have that go off into the ether and then receive an antiseptic decision back from the platform. It's to make justice more healing and more transformative, not to punish, but to heal. And how does that change your mindset? And to reduce the likelihood of future offenses, uh, which is a huge part of this. Um, guiding questions of restorative justice, and this is all taken from Howard Zare, who's a uh, an old school, like he was there in the 70s with the beaded jacket and the, and the roach clip and all that stuff, really really selling restorative justice in the criminal justice system. Uh, and he's written up these things. I'm stealing this off from him. Uh, so who has been harmed? That's an important question. What are their needs? Whose obligations are these? Who has a stake in the situation? What are the causes? And what is the appropriate process to put things right, right? Like if you think about this as the center of how you remediate an online harassment or the process of radicalization or any of those things, at the very least, I think it opens up a creative new tool set to start to deal with some of these bad things that can happen in an online space. I don't know that it solves the whole problem, and we'll get into that in a second. And I don't need you to read these. I know this is, I just put this up in case you had access to the slides, but there's a whole bunch of signposts, right? One of my favorite ones is find a meaningful way to involve community members and to respond to the community basis of the crime. Right? Restorative justice approaches bring in the community. And they think about what's the harm to the community, not just to the victim and not just to the perpetrator. All right, so there's a lot of critiques of restorative justice, and there always have been. Um, one is that it, places, it has the potential, at least, to place too much burden on the victim. Right? One of the things that can be re-traumatizing is to have to face your accuser. And if that, doesn't, if that is not structured particularly well, then you're going to have a hard time. Uh, recently, President Trump invited uh, some parents of a child who had been killed in the UK by an ambassador to the White House and had tried to set up a restorative justice meeting, right, between the uh, ambassador's wife who had killed their son and the parents of the son. But that was clumsily handled. You can't just put people into a room together and expect restorative processes to happen. There has to be mediation, there has to be structure, and that, that's often where victims get harmed is when there's not those processes in place. Uh, it may not fit every crime. There are most likely crimes that are not remediable, right? That cannot be restored and that should be sanctioned in different ways than restorative justice. Outcomes are not operationalized well. If I send a guy to the electric chair, that's a result, right? Uh, if, I, if, I get a, if I give you a, a ticket for $75 for parking a handicapped spot, that's, a, that's an operationalized, measurable result. If I restore your appreciation of the handicapped and uh, make it so that you would reconsider parking in those spots again, much harder to operationalize and think of as a success. And then doesn't scale, right? Which is always a complaint with these things. Well, actually, I may, I'm going to make the argument that it can scale better. So where have we seen this before? Uh, can we use restorative justice principles to address any of these online adversarial interactions? So we see this in a couple of places. Uh, the League of Legends tribunal system. Anybody ever played League of Legends? It's an online game. Uh, and they had this great process by where if you uh, uh, committed a transgression, you could be reported. Uh, and you and the person who was accusing you of the crime had to go in front of a tribunal, which was a jury of other players at your same level, who would then hear the evidence on both sides and help mediate a connection between you. Right? It's, it's one of the largest scale um, uh, uh, restorative systems I've ever seen in an online community. And it worked at the scale of tens of thousands. Right? Because, of course, you can systematize that. You can just put in place a system that will go out and find a random set of players at an appropriate level. You can systematize the data collection and what you need and the whole nine yards. I think you actually can do restorative at scale in online environments much better, actually, than you can in offline environments where logistics and transaction costs usually sink the value of restorative projects. Yeah? How would you combat the, basically described earlier, the you know, private forums or Telegram or wherever folks coordinate and then and mass come and say, no, this person did this thing, was is absolutely right. 
Yeah, I don't think that, that's a great question. So uh, brigading, basically, which is where you get, bring in a group of people to support a point of view. A system like this could be vulnerable to this. So this one's not because the players are chosen randomly from a very large pool. So the opportunity to set up a brigade from such a large pool would be very hard. Um, but the, this particular tribunal system might not stop radicalization. We might need to think of other mechanisms. Uh, my, uh, the student, Lindsay Blackwell, did a recent uh, radio thing with NPRs on the media where she and the NPR producer tried to conduct a restorative justice approach to uh, people who had been banned from different sub-reddits uh, uh, for different transactions against moderators, right? So in three cases, what they did is brought the moderator who had banned the user and the user together to try to mediate and uh, solve the problem. This is not a scientific approach, this is an NPR approach, right? Um, and in one of the cases, it worked beautifully. In one of the cases, it kind of worked. In one case, it failed. But, you know, as I pointed out to Lindsay, neither of them had any training or skill in mediation. I'm not sure that the mediation was actually any good, which is a huge X factor. But really interesting podcast if you're interested in hearing a larger discussion of this, of restorative justice and how it might work. So next steps, uh, Serena and I are working on a representative survey to measure kind of this perception of justice more broadly across a wider group of people. We're running different experiments to test different mechanisms in a lab environment, and then we're gonna run field testing of the environments. We're working on corporate partners to do that with. Uh, uh, I was saying I had Nextdoor lined up, but they fell through recently. Uh, Quora might participate. So looking at different places that allow us to test this in kind of live action environments. But that's a couple years down the road. Uh, I'm going to skip these so we can talk. The main question, though, I have is, what do you think? Can we use these restorative approaches to design these features? What should we be thinking about when we do this? Uh, what, I want to leave the rest of the time for Q&A. So what, what should I be thinking about that I'm not? And that's what I have. Yeah, go ahead. So imagine in the solve the sort of uh, hypothetical problem of how do we create a validated user? So we certify them based on you know, maybe an Equifax background check or whatever, yeah. where they answer a couple questions and assume we can solve the, oh, you've been... Uh, the cheap pseudonym problem, right? Yeah, basically solve the cheap pseudonym problem, but also protect the user's anonymity somehow so that maybe you don't expose their identity, but you can at least say only a registered user can um, engage with the platform. Mm -hmm. How would these challenges change? I mean, would it solve some of them? Would it make them more challenging in other ways? I think it depends a lot on the platform. Um, anonymity always gets blamed for a lot of the worst things that happen in these spaces. But we've done a series of studies that showed that even when actors are not anonymous at all, like when they're using their real names, they still behave pretty much almost as bad as they do when they're fully anonymous, right? And so I think that will solve a portion of the problems uh, and a certain type of problem. But if you scale up to more diverse groups where you're as good as anonymous because there's never any potential for consequence, then the real ID thing kind of falls apart a little bit. I guess so much of this has in the background just like what norms exist on these different platforms and kind of how norms have changed over time and over the growth of the internet. How do yeah. you think of the relationship between norms and affordances? That's a good one. So uh, the problem with features is often they afford things that the designers did not intend. Right, And so you can take a lot of features and pervert them into harassment features. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example right now, but it's easy to, for instance, do this in games and a lot of online communities. So with norms, norms uh, can be at the macro scale for an entire site, or they can be micro for a particular group within a community. And this gets into the theory of social deviance, right? When we think about social deviance, like um, the classic example in the sociolo sociological literature is um, gang members, right? A gang is socially deviant at the large scale. Their norms are very different from the kind of mass norms of the society, but within their cluster, they have tight norms for themselves. And so norms um, interact weirdly, to answer your question, with features because micro norms exist within subcultures and it's hard to know what those are and to predict how they're gonna interact with features. Marcus. Lots of arguments offline, you know, we get into arguments with yeah. the neighbors, relatives, and so on, you know, and so I'm just curious, like... Uh, oh, you do, I know. I know. <laughs> so, so I'm just curious, like, you know, why, why do we need a like, special system online? Is it because, you know, it's more frequent? Because, you know, you, I think you started with the assumption that, that this is a particular problem online, you know, but I mean, the thing is, I'm... I'm I haven't actually seen any data to really show that, you know, there's so many interactions, you know, I, you know, 
we look at pictures online, we look at photos, we look at all kinds of things. Yeah. I mean, how much worse is this problem online, really, you know, compared to all the terrible <coughs> things that happen in right. offline meetings and so on, so that we, yeah. we, we need a completely different sort of uh, justice system. Uh, if this would be like sort of an epidemic, comes like 100 times as, as frequently as happens offline, I could right. see this. But like, uh, you know, I haven't seen this data to sort of really, really justify this. And in fact, offline harms are actually, are, us are often much worse, right? Like, you're, you're talking a lot of physical harm, you're talking domestic assault, you're talking like offline harms can actually be even more consequential than these, well, often are much more consequential than these online harms. Uh, I, and I don't think we need a different approach. This restorative approach has been applied to the offline environment, right? And usually the effects are strong. Reduced recidivism, uh, people feel like they uh, most often feel like they, they've gotten something out of the process, both the victim and the perpetrator, often leads to uh, positive community effects uh, as they've been measured over the past 30 or 40 years. The problem has always been the money the scale and the fact that we have such a strong retributive perspective that people feel like it's not enough justice being done. So my, my, my argument is that there's nothing different about the online environment that makes restorative justice more appealing. It's actually the online environment makes retributive justice not effective and we should try this other branch of justice. Curious your thoughts on kind of crime prevention. Uh, uh, I mean, just for perspective, you probably wouldn't have seen it, but we did a little study with honor codes online mm. and found that honor codes weren't very effective in the context of online education and cheating. But the threat of having real consequences if you're caught yeah. prevents cheating much better. And so from, from that I took away, like, you know, even for the people who end up being good actors, you know, the, the, the imagination of consequences yeah. can, can eliminate crime in a way. And so, and also, I mean, is the idea that restorative would not have a retributive element that, I mean, you know, it's taking for me the time of a training course, I'm going to be embarrassed that I have to go through some process. Is, is it either retributive or restorative, or is the argument to do retribution that also restores? Or? Yeah, and I don't, I don't exactly know the answer to your question in an online context. Offline, restorative is most often paired up with retributive. Like a good example is sobriety courts. So if you get caught drunk driving, you can go to jail or you can go to sobriety court, which is a much more restorative approach where you meet with victims of drunk drivers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a process that's instead of you being incarcerated, but the threat of incarceration still holds over your head, right? Like you keep going to sobriety court because it's much better than peeing in front of a bunch of people in jail, right? So it's, it's uh, that in the US at least, how we've done restorative justice has very much been embedded in the threat of retributive justice. Now there are other places I need to investigate more, like New Zealand has been using restorative justice for their juvenile offenders for the past 15 years and have, great, have had great success in preventing further recidivism into crime and have reduced, they, they claim reduced their crime rates because of using restorative approaches at the right time but I don't know for sure. Which usually I would imagine involves some kind of in-person confrontation. How does that work with online? Because it's always struck me that the reason people are more obnoxious online is they're not actually interacting. With. They don't actually see the yeah, person they're interacting with. They don't touch and feel and have to see them the next day. So, yeah, the set of calm theories about why people interact poorly online is rich. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have a face-to-face -face interaction, but you would have a richer-than-usual interaction that's guided by a mediator of some type, right? It, it, yeah, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily have to be face-to-face -face or visual, or you wouldn't have to out yourself or who you actually are, but it would be maybe more synchronous, or there, there would be some richer media approach to having the, the interaction. Nancy? I'm wondering how you think about, um, we were talking earlier about systemic and individual actions, right. and I'm trying to kind of articulate this. You, you had that differentiation in the beginning between people who do bad things online and bad groups who use online, and I guess I'm wondering how you see 
in both of these cases, the cause, affordances may make it easier, right? You may feel anonymous, so you feel like, oh, okay, I can go after right. them. Like a ski mask. Right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So there may be affordances, but at the same time, there's societal issues that make you feel like, oh, it's cool to go after a woman if she stole from an old person, right. like you're saying, right? Yeah. Cunt is an appropriate word to use in these environments if you feel like. And those are those are societal questions that transcend the internet. Yeah. And seem sort of vaguely related to the bad groups that use the internet to do normal things. So I'm wondering yeah. how you think about the flows of these things. Yeah. Not that's, just from one media platform to another, but to the societal questions of restoring a more just world. Well, that is a rich question, just as we're ending. <laughs> uh, uh, just uh, two quick things. I know pe yeah, people want to get home to their families and stuff. So a couple of things. One is this is a, a broad weakness of the criminal justice system, right? Uh, criminal justice tended to come out of both moral philosophy and individual psychology. So criminal justice as a set of theories doesn't have a great approach to societal infrastructural problems. Their approach is the individual has transgressed. We must deal with the individual. Right now, what we're starting to look at now is social work theories. My wife's a social worker, and uh, when she hears about this work, she's like, you're an idiot. Um, so <laughs> she says that a lot. I'm not sure why. Uh, yeah, uh, that's right. <laughs> um, and I, I do think there are, there are social work theories and sociological theories that we should bring into this to tie with criminal justice to enrich that perspective. One more? Uh, why don't we, uh, yeah, why don't you take one more? Okay, thank you. Uh, one of my observations in terms of seeing harassment in, in offensive language and stuff like that has been, I mean, I, I've been sort of following way back in the 90s when, you know, before the, the browser became as sophisticated as today, and one of the places that it was very clear what you're talking about is the society, culture, country, A or B or C or D. Mm -hmm. And in, in some of them, each one of those uh, cultures, right, the harassment came in a different manner. Yeah. And, and for instance, uh, Latin American countries, 100% of the time, people would get frustrated because they could, uh, didn't have a, a good argument or politically different right. or, or whatever, and 100% of the time went in a sexual context. Yeah. And, and to the point that a lot of people say, I'm, you know, that's not the place for me. Yeah. And, I, I don't see it changing very much. I mean, it might have changed the, the issues, but it, it really shows an enormous frustration. Is the, the person who starts to harass us because he doesn't have a, uh, an answer to whatever is being said or, or done. Yeah. And I think the first step in this quote unquote answer is to themselves. I think it, whatever is there that irritates them or push their buttons. It's something that invalidates them mm -hmm. profoundly. Yeah. And so therefore, it, it goes into this sort of avalanche of, of uh, whatever is at hand. You know, could be uh, the, the bullying or, or, or you yeah. know, wh whatever the language, or they, they, they use it to, to vent their aggressivity. So what you say about restorative, it would be great, but, you know, uh, what can be done? I mean, I in fact I think having a place to vent is a good thing, because if yeah, you are venting be. there, you are not physically attacking someone or doing something else. Yeah, good. there's a bunch so, of common theories about that too. Yeah, I mean, what a couple that's a rich statement. So I'm only, the only thing I'm going to pick up on there is I think there's there are a bunch of cultural differences in how people express these things that I'm not qualified to answer, and I hope people pick up the work. Katie Pierce at the University of Washington, for instance, is doing a bunch of really great work looking at some of the cultural differences in how people respond to these kind of social media aggressions, and more, much more work needs to be done in the areas you're talking about. Yeah. All right. Let's bring to close and thank Cliff. Thank you. Thanks for having me.